Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Nouwen Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. We invite you to share the daily meditations and these podcasts with your friends and family. Today, you're in for a real treat. Award-winning author Anne Lamott is with us. Anne has written 19 books. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this latest one, Dusk, Night, Dawn, becomes her 16th bestseller. This book is a faith-based essay collection that shares from the depths of Anne how she has endured this global pandemic, and she shares very personally about what it's like for her to be married for the first time at 65. Like so many of the books that I treasure, which have been written by Anne Lamott, this one is packed with searing honesty and lots of humor. Anne Lamott reminds me so much of Henry Nouwen. He too was so honest to the core that it disarms readers and they find themselves saying, oh, that's just like me. Anne Lamott is well loved for her wit, her brave honesty and her passion for truth. I'm so glad to have this opportunity to talk with Anne once again. And let's start with the title, Dusk, Night, Dawn, on Revival and Courage. Why this name? The last book I did was on hope. It was called Almost Everything. And I was traveling around the um, war, the country doing um, bookstores book stores and auditoriums and churches on hope. But everywhere I went, people... Um, had <clears throat> um, no hope. <laughs> they felt defeated. I mean, here in America, we'd had two years of Trump. We had the UN climate change reports had come out. We had fires, and and we had every family, many families, had a lot of scary stuff happening at their own dining table. They had scary teenagers or tough marriages or uh, grown uh, elders in decline. So I set out to write a book about um, that would address where they could get hope. Um, so um, let's see. Oh, okay. Then what happened next was that I discovered that twilight meant both dawn and dusk, dusk and dawn. It, and because I felt like America had never been in a darker night of the soul, but the twilight means the light before. Um, the night, the light disappears, and then the, the dawn, of course, is when the um, light reappears. And so I wrote about how hard it is in between times, in the night, knowing the dawn will appear, but exhausted and maybe cold and not able to see much. Well, I, I, I have absolutely loved the book. It's delicious. I really have enjoyed it. Um, you know, you ask a lot of important questions in it, There's, and it's so typically you, Anne, it's full of some real raw honesty. I mean, really, it's right there. Uh, it, you say, I continue to believe that love is sovereign. But it's, um, here, let me read it. It says, I continue to believe, at 66, I continue to believe that love is sovereign here and that the hardest work we do is self-love and forgiveness. And I find that's kind of a penetrating theme throughout all the things that I've read of yours because you you bring that to the table. You bring that sort of uh, taking away the mask and saying, this is what's really going on with me. This is what my battlefield is. And that's, I think, where so many of us connect with you and where I feel like you always connect to me with Henry Nouwen because Henry Nouwen got it. He was very much in his writing talking about this issue of forgiving oneself, that self-hatred is maybe the biggest issue that we face. And, uh, that honesty is is very brave. Thank you. Well, yeah, you know, it's it it is very Henry Nowen, the um, extreme existential loneliness of being here on the incarnational side of things, and the you know the dependent the tendency towards depression or towards sorrow for sensitive people, which I definitely you know, definitely was a highly sensitive child. And, um, you know, there was that book out in the 50s when I was coming up for the parents of people like me who were so sensitive and who just really, really felt 
things and cried or 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 hid and um that's i think so much why i was so drawn to henry now and in the first place was that he wrote from that same place of separation from himself and that deep deep loneliness of that and uh accompanying despair and um and um juxtaposed to the divine light of God's love and then the shame of not just basking in that love but instead feeling oh I have to yell at the dog um instead feeling really <laughs> troubled by how hard it is here for certain kinds of people like me and Henry feel free to yell at your dog if you need to yell at him <laughs> okay that's okay. We'll get rid of her. Here, we'll send her away. We'll banish her to study hall. Okay. Okay, okay. Sounds good. Well, it's funny because the other part of you that reminds me so much of Henry is I really find in your writing you are a wounded healer. You take your own wounds and you take them out and you share them. And it in that, they become food for others. They become they they become food for very hungry souls. I know when I first started reading you, it was like, oh, somebody gets me. Somebody's telling this this story that that I feel has seen the insides of me. And I think there's incredible blessing in being that wounded healer. Not everybody can do it with such honesty, and at the same time, mix it with so much wit, which is your gift. Oh, thank you. Well, when I was a girl, young woman. Of 23, and my dad got sick with brain cancer that he would die of two years later. Um, I wrote a book. My dad said, I'm going to write about this. I, why don't you write your version of what this family's going through? And then, um, and so I, because there wasn't a book out there then. I mean, your one's immediate response, if you're a literary type, to crisis or, you know, devastation is to find a book about somebody you can trust who's gone through that. And um, then there just wasn't anything because it hadn't really come out of the closet yet. You, death was unseemly. You weren't allowed to say the word cancer in polite society. And so I wrote a book, and um, that was, I think, funny, called Hard Laughter. And, um, be, and I've always told my writing students to write what they would love to come upon. And when it was published, so many people said, Oh my God, we're we're just starting to go through that now. You saved me. I didn't know you could do this. I didn't know you could say that. I didn't know you could refuse to do this anymore, or or insist on the right to do this from now on, or anything like that. So that was. Um, and people say it's just so healing for someone to tell the truth about what a nightmare it is. <laughs> You know, and no matter how much faith you have or how many the blessing of incredible people around you, it's a nightmare when to lose somebody that you can't live without. And so I think then that I stepped into something that maybe Henry had written about better than anybody. And then the next book I wrote, the next novel I wrote was called Rosie, and in it a girl is subjected to a uh, perverse man, her father's best friend, and um, doing a, a overtly sexual thing, but not directly to her, but just like ruining, you know, her Rosie, this little girl's sense of serenity and safety. And um, no one was writing about it yet. What men do to look to girls, and um, and how they use them for their own gratification and power. And so, and that was like amazing how many women came up to me just crying and saying, I've never read about that before. Um, I, I'm i so, uh, can I talk to you about it? Yes, well, that the talking about it with somebody safe is the healing, which Henry knew so well. And so uh, I guess I felt like that was my mission statement, was to say stuff that other people weren't saying about the truth of our, our baby souls and our baby selves um, that might, by saying them out loud, help others. It's it's interesting because um, I I so value the fact that you have done that. I I think people find their um, courage to somehow be more real, courage to be honest. You it, you talked about here there was something which I thought 
just kind of captures you, but captures so many of us. You said you were talking about your friend Allie, and it's in this chapter on uh, soul lather, and it says, Allie and I shared a struggle with perfectionism, the most toxic condition for the soul. The next most toxic is the ensuing and chronic contempt for oneself, the belief that one is secretly defective and less than. The next is the obsession that one is right and better than. I just, I love that because this, I find it in page after page in this book because you, it doesn't seem to go away and yet it does. It's like, I think in some ways you've memorized the pathway off the merry-go-round of that, that um, self-hatred in a way, but you have to go back to it again and again. Situations seem to come up in these stories that tell me you've the situation has thrown you back into something and then you find your way out of it. And it's the finding the way out that is such a gift to us. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope so. I mean, as I said, I um, tell my writing students to write what they'd love to come upon. And um, so one thing I'd love to come upon is people with a sense of humor and faith who have ended up in dark nights of the soul or just the crisis of self-loathing and of having maybe done something for which the culture tells them they can't be forgiven or their parents told them that and, um, and who somehow through the movement of grace in their lives, through maybe a very best friend, through maybe a, who knows, therapist or a, little child or, uh, or just some, just some, uh, in uh, unlikely moment of insight where you smite your own forehead and all of a sudden you have operating instructions on how to, how to <laughs> be back as an advocate or a, a, a mother or, a, or the father and the prodigal son about again, which Henry wrote better than anybody, um, that just, gives you the path forward, a little light to see by, and and maybe a beautiful companion. So that's my, those are my very favorite stories of all when I read them by other people. So um, that's what I love to write. I love the fact you tell us about your your companion, Neil. Tell me about how this is going, your soulmate. Clearly marrying at 65 must have been a challenge for you. Uh, must have taken some courage. Tell me about Neil and tell me about... This, this book is packed with your relationship, the, the, the ups and the downs of it, the beauty and the, and the difficulties. Well, um, let's see. That's such, I mean, the whole book is about that, so it's hard to answer in a, in a quick question. But the, for me, the scariest thing we do is to let people see us and know us. You know, there's that chapter called Can You Love Me Now that's based on a, oh, yeah. I don't know if you had the Verizon commercial in Canada, but um, but here, this poor guy is walking all over his property and to various ends of the house trying to get a little reception and saying, uh-huh. can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Well, now? Can you hear me now? And so <laughs> the book is a lot about how I chose and decided and was really encouraged by Neil to reveal myself to him as he revealed himself to me. And it's like, can you love me now? This was so terrible what I've done or how I think or, or, um, or my, or how judgmental I am or how, how mentally ill and how, how, um, how everything I am, can you love me now? Can you love me now? So, um, I should add also that not only did I have the, the, courage and blessing of, of getting married two years ago <clears throat> at the age of 65, three years after I got Medicare, but I also was married for two years, one of which was spent in lockdown. So I hadn't really <laughs> um, included that in my vows. And, um, and so that's had its own kind of challenge. And of course, there are a lot of stories about this in the book and about um, really being newly married in COVID college when we're all having to learn new ways of being, new ways of coping, new ways of being fully alive when we really can't go anywhere safely. When I was in, you know, in, of course, America, half 50% of America was just enraged and 
heartbroken by Trump's response to, response to COVID response in air quotes, and um, and through it all, Neil and I were trapped in our house. <laughs> and um, you know, you go. We took lots and lots of walks, six feet apart from our neighbors, uh, in masks, and we we did everything we could to create a new ordinary. And of course, the whole book is about the salvation to be found in the ordinary, in ordinary life, if you're paying attention and if your intention is to be fully alive and to be really awake here and to stop hitting the snooze button finally. And, um, but that has really been challenging. You know, I'm, I, I travel for my work. I travel to give talks and, and usually I would have been for the last month and on a book tour one, a couple of times Neil's come with me, but He's used to traveling. He's got kids uh, in in Denver and in, in Colorado and in Chicago and L.A. And usually he'd go to visit them, and I just love being alone. I mean, that's one of the reasons I never married was that I just love being alone. And um, and he has, doesn't go anywhere, you know. <laughs> and so and so it's been a different paradigm than used than the normal. Um, newlywed experience. Well, it's it's interesting because as I read the book, I thought everybody who is in a committed relationship needs to read this book. There's so much honesty about how we navigate relationships, how we how we navigate that core question, you know, can you love me now? I, I mean, that just jumps yeah. off the page and I love it. There's another thing I enjoy in your writing. I mean, you, you say things that I go, oops, I think that too, and, and it's not just oh, just yeah. like me, but but you know, you say I hate being wrong, and that's hard in relationships. It's, you know, it's it is one of the great realities of relationships. There's going to be times you're wrong. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> how is this changing you, or how is it, or are you very much the same? And someone's just made good room for the real you. Uh, I think you know all truth is paradox, and so. I'm exactly the same person I was at five and six. I mean, that's so, what's so touching and heartbreaking about Henry's work to me. And, and when I first discovered him as a teenager was the wounded child, you know, the scared, um, sad, curious, um, lonely, desperate to pre please little kid that he be, was still um, carrying with him at Harvard and Yale, you know, and and um, and that that were grown and mm-hmm. transformed and and matured by life, especially by the harder times and by being loved to the degree that we're loved. I mean, not to the degree, but that we are changed molecularly by having been loved at various times in our lives by people who could genuinely see us because we trusted them enough to let them see us. And we have been changed molecularly by having been trusted by other people to see them and to be in that sacred space of no mask and of no body armor and of no, you know, performance art. Like there's a piece in the book I love that quotes my friend Duncan Trussell, who's a comedian, when he says, when you first meet me, you're meeting my bodyguard. And we're changed when people will trust us enough, whether it's people we know intimately and or whether it's somebody who, because of our work, trusts us and wants to share something with us. It changes us to be trusted and it changes us to be loved and seen. And so we are that small child um, in this very dangerous and harsh and unfair world. And we are the more mature person who's grown both in Christ and in, um, I don't, I'm not even sure what the word would be, but just in the maturity of becoming people of mercy. As I think mercy is maturity. I think as you mature, you become more and more merciful because you realize what people have been through who, who seem to be acting very, very badly. Like in here in America, January 6th, the insurrection against democracy, you, mm. it's so natural and, uh, and for me automatic to feel harsh and critical and really almost hatred for them. And then, but the maturity 
of just growing older and having stayed alive and <laughs> having had a ton of therapy. And I have 35 years pretty soon clean and sober in the precious community of the 12 step world. And, um, and, and so the hate and judgment and response and whatnot was just as kind of feverish as it always has been, but didn't last as long because I think mercy is maturity. And I started to see these people like in their horns and their, you know, erecting gallows for Mike Pence and all the stuff that they were doing. And I understand that that was done to them. And I don't think I knew that at 21, that hurt people hurt people and that people that were violated and brutalized violate and brutalize others. And so, um, yeah, that's a long way of answering that. I think, um, yes, the same person and, and the same person with many, 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 many years of, uh, experience here on this funny blue marble of incarnation. That's a pretty compassionate answer. It means a lot because I did find within the book you talk about forgiveness. And at some point you realize that we all have dual citizenship here, he called it, perfect and neurotic. And and you bring together the reality that we, I think, all need forgiveness and we need to be able to forgive others. One of the things that struck me as I read this book and I've read many of your books, and I have really loved them. I, I realize that the pain of parents that did not love well permeates all your books. As yeah. you explain the journey from the deep disappointment to finding self-love and to finding God, God's love. Uh, I, in some ways, it's, it's a, a high cost to pay. Uh-huh. But in a way, that incredible disappointment in life has actually been the very food, the source, the nurturing that you can give to others because you had to find your way through it. Yeah, exactly. And I have a bit of a um, roadmap, you know, that this works, this doesn't work. This does work. Try this. Be brave. Do it afraid. And don't bother. <laughs> this is, re- you know, and so, uh, and that's what I love to read. Yeah. Like when I wrote the book about my dad's cancer, um, there's so many things that really make a difference with um, when you have run out of any more good ideas. Uh, My friend Janine Reed, which is R-E-I-D, wrote a brilliant, beautiful, beautiful book last year called The Opposite of Certainty, based on the great um, Paul Tillich line that the opposite of faith is um, not doubt, but certainty. Um, her son that just died of brain cancer at the uh-huh. age of 23, and she wrote a book about keeping faith and staying in Christ's love when uh, the ground is just shifting underneath you like sand all the time for 13 years. And so um, I love that so much. I love people that will tell the truth about just mm-hmm. not yeah. having a clue yeah. of what's true or what will help or what you shouldn't even bother with. You know, her book a lot, and, and I think a lot about what I write and, and the whole realm of forgiveness that you broached, you know, that, that my belief in a lot of this book is that Earth is forgiveness school, and, you know, some days go better than others. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this uncertainty and this doing it afraid and so much of what Henry's life was about was him often being in terror and often being in self-loathing and often being in separation from both self and God and life. And where do we start? You know, and, and Janine's book and Henry's books and my books are like, where do we start? And is it really true that God will meet us, that grace will meet us wherever it finds us? And then it won't leave us where it found it found us. And is it really true? It's like, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you love me now? And so a lot of this book and my friend Janine's book, and for me, a lot of what I love so much as a young person about Henry's books was, I'm not positive about much of anything, but I did this. I got into service. I got out of myself. I tended to somebody who was challenge beyond all imagining. And in that service, I found God. 
I found peace. It's like when wow. Jesus says, cast your bread upon the waters, yeah. and, we, and it will come back to you. It's the casting of the bread that heals us, you know, the trust inherent in, tr- in casting our bread upon the waters. And, um, and what Henry's, the books that I read of Henry's, which are, are many, are so much about doing things afraid, doing things sad, yeah. you know? Yeah. Did, w- did that make sense, by the way? Yes, it did. It did make sense to me. It did. It's You just, uh, quite frankly, you're just nurturing my heart right now. So I'm just letting you talk on because I love it. I, I One of the chapters in your book, you know, I looked at it, the title was Light Breezes, and I thought, oh, here we go for something kind of lighthearted. And oh my goodness, you surprised me. You go into she. And pretty soon, soon I discover that she is dread. Oh, yeah. And dread is having a field day. And I... I really, I felt like that was kind of for me the the low point and the high point of this book because it was, it was what I I, I could identify so much with it. Tell me a bit about you, you. You are able to name it well and speak of it with such honesty. Dread, dreads having a field day. Yes. Well, you know, one thing is that I did marry this guy, you know, Alan. <laughs> And he did write a book, and it's about to be published, but it's also what he's been talking about with me for four and a half, almost five years, is that he call, he's written a book about the super, he, he's writing a book and talks a lot about the superego. And I begin a chapter with um, my governess, grow, Dread was my governess growing up. Yeah. And it's, it turns out to be exactly the same thing, that this this parasitic voice inside of us that I would call Dread um, with a capital D, yeah. um, and he would call the superego, uh, kept us alive for the first six or seven years, kept us from um, running out into the street, kept us from swimming out past our ability to stay afloat. But that by about seven, we were very good with traffic and with um, swimming, and we became stronger swimmers. And yet this parasitic voice was so deeply internalized in us, institutionalized by the culture and by our parents, to stay afraid and to stay small and to stay under the control of this voice. And so when I do anything, like to be on book tour, to to, be, to, to fall in love, to have a child at 35 alone and with no money, it, I was driven by this voice that kept me small and scared. And then, of course, the Christ voice says, I'm right here, or it's Mary, right? It's it's Guadalupe, <laughs> Mary in her brown motherhood telling the little boy in the 1500s, don't be afraid, I'm right here. <laughs> and so this one, you know, but so we toggle between those two. And Neil, you can find out about him because the work is very profound and has changed me at shapesoftruth.com. But the work he does is to bring forth the superego for his clients and his readers literally onto the table facing us so he can talk to it and to say, who hired you? And the answer is, we hired it. We hired you. We hired it. We hired dread. We, we are safe. Uh, we believe we're safe when we're small and cringy. And that when we're big and juicy, especially for a woman, we're in trouble. We're in danger. Yeah. You know, big, juicy women get exiled. And when I was coming up, they got divorced. They were they were divorced and they were exiled and they were put in institutions. And so the message is don't get big and juicy. Whereas Jesus is saying, get big and juicy, carry the word, you know, <laughs> be me with skin on. And, and so... Um, that his teachings, uh, Neil's teachings, really, really changed me because what he does with his clients is help them say, "Oh, I hired you," and then to promise the governess or the superego, "We'll never fire them. We'll never get rid of them this side of eternity." But we can um, suggest to them we have a fabulous new job in the library, and they will be the the. Um, ethical consultant for the community and whenever we need an ethical consultation we'll go to the library (laughs) and they in the meantime they can sit there and read which is all any of us ever wanted to do when we grew up anyway (laughs) and that they will be summoned and that we are very very grateful for their service and their wisdom and they they never resist they are always they always think it's like a 
promotion. <laughs> and, um, and so then we can get on with writing whatever wants to be written or with loving whoever wants to be loved. Oh, I love that. Now, you said, is it, is it called Shapes of Truth? Is that the... Shapes. Shapes of Truth. Of truth. Well, we'll, I, I, audience, please go and, and visit shapesoftruth.com. Let's meet Neil as well. I think, I think we're in for a treat. Um, what are the light and gentle breezes that lift the dread from your heart these days? It's it, We're still in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, I love that. <laughs> but tell us. I think there's a whole chapter, isn't there, on breezes? Yeah. yeah. Because my, do- my dog is old, which I hate. And, um, and so sh- we go to the vet fairly regularly. And we went one time when I, that I wrote about in the extreme heat that has become our reality. And... Um, and I, and and I wrote about well the love of the vet was a gentle breeze, the vet when I went back to pick up my dog, who I thought might have liver cancer, but who had in some, instead something that was kind of treatable. Like doctors always say, oh everyone always thinks it's a zebra, but it usually turns out to be a horse. <laughs> and so my dog just had a horse that we could treat, yeah. and my vet's eyes were filled with tears because she loves my dog Ladybird and me both so much. That kind of love and care is a gentle breeze. And nature is a gentle breeze. You know, one of the acronyms for God, besides the gift of desperation or good orderly direction, is the great outdoors, you know. And to get outside, not in the heat, but in the cool of the morning, is a gentle breeze that bathes your soul. And um, calling a friend and saying whatever is true. I call my friend whose son died, Janine excuse me, almost every morning, and I say, I'm not every morning, but when I'm in, when I'm stressed or struggling, and I say, I hate everyone, and I hate all of life, and she she doesn't say, well, Annie, you know, you're a Sunday school teacher, how can you, <laughs> you know, how did it, she'll say, oh, I'm so glad you called me to, let's go to Target, you know, <laughs> and then we'll go shop, and um, that almost always helps, and um, so, Truth is a gentle breeze, the truth of a of a trusted friend, the outdoors, walking around the garden, like right now in California, in Northern California, there are daffodils everywhere, everywhere oh. if your intention is to pay attention and to, yeah. to see evidence of God everywhere. And so you see these hilarious flowers with their orange and yellow clown frills on and their huge noses. And and you see sh- green shoots breaking through the grout of the garden p- patio tiles, and and those are gentle breezes. And you see the birds that 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 are having babies. You see birds building nests. You see if you take a drive out in the countryside near where we live, you see baby lambs. Mm-hmm. And those are gentle breezes, and poetry for me is gentle breezes, and all of the great theologians for me, very, very much Henry and uh, C.S. Lewis and Denise Levertoff and Mary Oliver, Mary Oliver, any Mary Oliver poem is a gentle breeze. You write, laughing is the breeziest breeze of them all. Laughter is grace exhaling bubbly breath. I love that. <laughs> Thank you, yes. Laughter is the greatest breeze of all because it's breath. It's breath in a certain way. Yeah, it's breath. It's a gas. It's an inhalation. It's an exhalation. It's like a reset button to laugh um, when you haven't been feeling that life is very funny sometimes. Well, I, you know, you help me so much. I, that's just being honest. Uh, I love the way you make me think freshly about things. I feel like you're always taking me in through your writing to a different angle on a reality in my life. And I really value that. I want to encourage those that are listening, get this book. It's really a gem. It's really good. Dusk, night, dawn. It's a treasure. It oh, really is. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I just, I, I found in it the laughter eases for me I mean laughter opens you up to to receive truth that's that's a great reality and so there's enough laughter in this and the laughter almost always seems to be where you go oh my goodness that's just like me it makes me laugh and I I really appreciate that I want to thank you for writing in such a way that pain and truth surface and 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 grace and uh, and laughter are all released I, I really I really value that Anne and I'm so grateful thank you 
Oh, thank you so much. You know, Henry is, you know how sunflowers turn toward the sun and um, they turn their faces to the sun. And there were these faces when I was a teenager to whom I could, could turn. And I know you know what I'm talking about because all teenagers are, you know, disfigured and full of self-loathing <laughs> and terror, really, about having to become grown-ups when we see what a mess the grown-ups around us have made of their life. And even before I was a believer, in the 60s, people would hand you Henry Nowen, and people would wow. hand you Thomas Merton. And because mm-hmm. I come from a liberal, very left-wing, progressive family, I got my mitts on Dorothy Day. And I got oh. and I took philosophy all through my teens yeah. and went away to college in my teens and people handed you Simone Weil, you know? I all I can think of is I think it was changing the soil. I think it was getting ready the soil I think it was for too. what was going exactly. to be planted in you. It was I mean it was softening it and making it aware in a direction that it hadn't been given to you as a child but was being given to you through books and and thank goodness you received it i mean you really have received it and and uh well i think that's what grace is right that grace is somehow we run out of good ideas and i always write in my books that grace is spiritual wd-40 you know and and in those (laughs) places and that's where we're knotted up and and clenched and um We somehow, if we can just allow life and maybe a a beautiful friend or a poet to insert that thin, rich straw into us, um, we get spritzed. And and I got spritzed, and Henry was one of my spritzers. And uh, as I said, Denise Levertoff, I mean, uh, and some of these great Catholic poets and... Mm. um, And then finally, I mean, the most unlikely spritz of all, I mean, Henry makes sense, Thomas Merton makes sense, Um, Mary Oliver makes sense, but Malcolm Muggeridge, when I was coming up, my (laughs) dad loved Malcolm Muggeridge because he was this Uh cranky, iconoclastic BBC intellectual, and he hated the church, and then he converts. And he becomes a passionate, passionate believer. He discovers Mother Teresa, he writes a, a beautiful, he does a pod, uh, not one podcast, he does <laughs> a, a documentary for the BBC. I yeah. think it's called uh, A Beautiful Thing for God, because Mother Teresa says famously that no one can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. He does a documentary, he is transformed, like bolt of lightning transformed. And so for me to know about Malcolm Muggeridge and to have been raised kind of worshiping him as a intellectual atheist and then to discover the movement of grace in his life had brought him to Jesus, mm-hmm. um, that book, there's a book called Rediscovering Jesus, and it was all short pieces, short takes, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. screen screenplays or whatever you would call them if they were Mm -hmm. for a documentary, um, his travels, and a long, long, long interview at the end of it, it literally blew my mind, like like sitting next to a Buddhist gong, where you're reading it and you're going, mong, you know, (laughs) and C.S. Lewis, too, who was so funny and so brilliant and um, wrote so much about pain and the mercy, pain and mercy and the dark night of the soul. And um, they were like Buddhist gongs for me. But there was something about Henry in that, like with Thomas Merton, who was so influenced by Buddhism and meditation and contemplation, he was sort of like somebody that I didn't think my parents would hate because he was so Buddhisty and so <laughs> my parent my father was raised in Japan and so for him to have for Merton to have such a passion for um con- for contemplation and meditation I felt like was not not um n- n- totally anathema to my father but but Henry is so vulnerable Henry is without armor. So Henry at first is in the Divinity School at Yale and Harvard, and those are like the highest accolades that my father could have ever imagined, and uh, to be professors there, to be teachers and lecturers there. But then for him, Henry, to present without armor and to present 
as a person of soul and of spirit and as as a child and as somebody who renounces all that to go to a place of people who are the exact opposite of who my father worshipped all those years. (laughs) And for him to find himself and God and peace at the same time there. I don't know how to pronounce Is it Larch? It's Larch. Larch. Larch, Larch, Larch. Yeah, Larch. it's actually the French word for the Ark. The Ark, Larch. yeah, Larch. Larch. To go to Larch, yeah. where nobody is doing heavy intellectual banter, such as I was raised on, and to become subsumed by spirit and, and, and divine love and service, in service, mm-hmm. through service, um, is like the most radical teacher I could ever find. And when I found him, I had to blink back tears because he was so vulnerable. He had genius. He had spiritual, theological genius. And he was absolutely as vulnerable as as a person could ever be. And in sharing that vulnerability, he gave me strength. It's interesting, too, because uh, if you go to the very base of Henry and you and the similarities we've talked about, this self hatred that was, you know, he was the first for me to say that that was the biggest thing we had to deal with was to forgive ourselves. Yeah. When you go to the base of it, you find Henry comes out with, you are a beloved child of God. Yeah. And he has figured it out for himself that he's beloved. And the very person that can't love themselves realizes God loves us more than than there are words to say. And I, I think that's an amazing and profound base discovery. Other people can say it, but when you when you come that journey of being so hard on yourself to realize God really loves you. He's not yeah. kidding. He yeah. really loves you. Yeah. And and that's what you bring us too. I mean that's that that's where I see the two of you wonderful friends. I think you would have been great friends if you'd ever got to meet. I think there's this kind of freneticness about Henry that I think you would have adored. <laughs> oh, thank you. Anyway, I I'm so glad for this time with you. I'm so glad you are a you're a treasure to me as a, as a writer, a beautiful writer. I mean, the the pages are full of beauty and full of wonder and words that are so well put together. But beyond that, I always I I, I find this depth that has grown in you a, a, a woman of God a woman who who has dared to to trust in God's grace I love it thank you Karen that means a lot to me thanks for giving me this time with you that means a lot to me thank you so okay. much okay you to have a beautiful beautiful blessed and dopey day thank and you. God bless you good oh thank you very much take care blessings okay bye-bye bye-bye Thank you for listening to today's podcast. I hope you got as much out of it. I love Anne Lamott. I love her books. Do get this latest one, Dusk, Night, Dawn. You'll love it. I honestly, there's so much good there. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we'd be so grateful if you take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up or even share it with your friends and family. For more resources related to today's podcast, click on the links on the podcast page of our website. You can find additional content, book suggestions, all the ones that were mentioned during this interview, and and you can hear from Anne's comments just how valuable his writings have been to her. Perhaps it's time for you to discover this nurturing, voice of love and truth. Henry Nowen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nowen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nowen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.